Okay, so the the next kind of sample is uh, case, what I call cased whole bottomal sample. Um, it's only used for oils, um, and we basically have a casing set. We've got perforations uh, into the formation, um, and we run on a wire line a sampling device. It's uh, going to measure pressure and temperature as well, but it's basically just hanging there. Um, and either as the well is flowing at a low rate or has been flowing and is now shut in. It can be either case. So these are collected either during a low flow rate. The idea being that you want to keep the bottom will pressure as high as possible. For example, to avoid asphaltine precipitation. Avoid gas coming out of solution. Um, or uh, during a shut-in, the well has been shut in after flowing, after production testing. I, I can't really give you a good reason to do it one way or the other, um, but uh, so unless you've got a good reason. The point is that we, we have relatively high pressure. Presumably we have a, a well that is single phase oil. That's, that's what you're shooting for. Single phase oil. And when we open the sampler, there's a, you know, it's got some kind of mechanism it opens and then you get flow into the sampler, it fills up you know, with presumably the oil. I don't know what the samplers look like, but they fill up. Then um, there are two types. The one is a type where the sampler maintains the pressure at or above the pressure during sampling. Okay? So there's some samplers that um, there's some bottom hole samplers will maintain the pressure greater than um, in the bottle greater than the pressure during sampling as the tool is removed Okay, and that's again to, to, to avoid this asphaltine precipitation or gas coming out of solution. You, you try to keep the sample single phase. Okay. I think the default sampler doesn't have that functionality. You have to pay for a little more expensive sampler for, for getting that, um, that characteristic. If you don't have wax or asphaltine precipitation, then you probably don't really need to worry about it. Um, I don't know whether they have samplers that maintain the temperature in a sense to avoid the wax precipitation. It's not really my area on the tools. So maybe they also have samplers that can, can maintain uh, temperature, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure.
Okay. So that's without getting, I don't think we need any really more details than that. Is there any questions about what the, um, this is used to be the kind of default for all oil wells, okay? Now, because the MDT samples are there and their bottom hole samples there are more common, this is becoming less and less common um, in general. Yeah, why is it not used for gas? Yeah, that's that's kind of always a, that's a good question, and a lot of people ask it. Um, the main reason is that if you have a gas well, um, um, then basically the the well bore is full of gas. So ideally, it would be full of gas, and you sample the gas into the container, but if historically, I mean, during the testing, if you got liquids in the production tubing because maybe you flowed at low rates, you had some liquid dropping down, you didn't have enough rate to lift the liquids. If, if for some reason you have condensate accumulation down in the well bore, okay, when you sample, you may get some of that excess liquid hanging in the oil. You know, it's flowing at a low rate, so maybe this. This, this condensate is just like going up and down and up and fluct, kind of fluctuating up and down and your sampler is in the middle of this two-phase system. So when you sample, you don't sample the gas, you sample some odd mixture. So it has to do with two-phase effects in the, in the production, in the tubing casing, okay, and the fact that gravity, the liquid is going to be hanging down in the area where your sampler is. And you don't want to, you don't want to sample excess liquid because that would give you a misleading composition, a misleading sample. So that's the reason that you don't do it. You don't, it's not recommended for gas condensates. OK? So. Quick question. Yeah. Would you say that will not be a representative composition? In situ, they're in situ representative composition. In situ. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to that after we finish the the, the discussion. Um, but but generally speaking, the the yeah. So we'll, we'll come back to that. The the types of representative sample. We'll, we'll get back to that. Let me finish this. Okay. So these are the three types of, of samples out there. Um, and you've got at least some, uh, some understanding of, of, of that. Um, so, so now the question we're going to try to answer is why collect samples at all. Okay, now we have three methods. Why, why would we collect them at all? The first reason would be to, to um, To get an estimate of what is initially in situ in the reservoir. Okay? And I'm going to talk about the composition of, okay, if you have the composition, you can get the gas oil ratio and, and everything else. But basically, what is the initially in situ reservoir composition in the reservoir? Now, 
Um, what we know is that in many cases there are spatial variations. in this reservoir composition uh, in the x, y, z direction. But if I use x, y, z, <laughs> you're going to get confused with composition x, y, z. Okay? So I have to be careful here. So I'm going to use i, j, k. i, j, and k as directional vectors. Okay? So as a function of i, J and K, compositions can vary. And mapping that spatial variation is like mapping the spatial variation of permeability or porosity or water saturation or anything else that varies spatially. So we have to have some idea of, of what fluids are where. Okay, so that's the one reason is, and we call this trying to establish the initial fluids in place. Okay, that's what this is. I don't really know. I mean, I, I would suspect that the, you know, you have different kinds of cost. In, the, in, the, in all cases, you have the cost of the service itself. But offshore, time is the biggest money factor. So you, you have to factor that in um, to the total cost. In other words, if, you're, if your operation is dedicated to sampling, you have to take the, op the cost of the sampling operations plus the cost of the time to do the operations. That's the most important thing. And that's why they drop production testing and sampling during production testing where you don't really need to do production testing. You're saving time. The cost of the services themselves, I, in all honesty, I would suppose that MDT is more expensive than conventional bottom hole sampling and separator sampling is the least expensive in general. I'm probably wrong, but that's what I would guess. So. The second reason to collect samples, the second reason is to, um, is to build a PVT model Okay, a PVT model to describe uh, gas and oil properties and we've talked about those densities, viscosities, phase amounts so I'm going to put that as um, what you guys did in the calculation of the flash calculation um, FV or relative how much in a two-phase system how much is oil okay that's relative oil volume or this is relative vapor fraction this is on a molar basis this is on a volumetric basis so it's the relative amounts of the two phases okay that would include saturation pressure because that's where you have an infinitesimal amount of the one phase. Saturation pressure, either bubble point or dew point. And compositions of phases below the saturation pressure of the initial fluid. So how do compositions change? 
how do k values change as a function of pressure. That's what you're really trying to get out of this, is that you're really trying to get out from this kind of information an indirect measure of how are the k values changing. There. We don't usually measure k values. But if we measure just the gas composition or maybe the oil composition, you, you can get k values. But um, that's really the only data we measure. These are the only data we use in engineering calculations. Densities, viscosities, the amount of each phase, and the phase compositions. Okay? That's it. And the PVT model... that's used today, okay, the PVT model that we use today, there's two types. There's empirical correlations, of which chapter three is full of, and standing, who you now know the name well, was the one who created the most, the most accurate, and the most widespread collection of correlations. They were not purely empirical, they were empirical fits of massive amounts of measured data. Okay? So they're not just purely empirical, but they're tuned equations, but they have no foundation in some equation of state or something theoretical. So these are empirical correlations for example, those of standing. He developed many of these. And the second type is a, a more rigorous thermodynamic model that has consistency in describing gas, oil, critical, near critical, single phase, everything. So basically, what we're going to call equation of state um, I'm going to call it a consistent equation of state meaning that it handles gas and oil and critical phenomena in the same way it it doesn't ask you know, is this, a, like the correlations, oh, this is a gas correlation, or it's an oil correlation, and you have to know. The equation of state, a consistent equation of state, will treat any fluid phase, be it gas or oil, or we don't know, in the same way. So it's consistent. It doesn't really have to know what phase it is. So the type of equation of state we use are called cubic equations of state of which the first one was this Van der Waals way back in 18 something 60 uh, in the 60s I think okay that's not used anymore basically but we have two other types one is called the SRK and the, these two here are the ones that are used in reservoir production process engineering Basically, this is it. Suave, Red to Kwong, just so we have a little history lesson. And this is originally 1949 and then 1972, I think. They, and the Peng Robinson was 1977 and 1976 and 78, I think. I don't know, 70, around 1977. About the same time I came to Norway. So. Okay. <coughs> and this, since about the 1990s, it started around 1980 being used, but by the 1990s 
this was the model of choice, okay, in petroleum engineering and so forth. So this, this kind of, uh, this, if we take 1940s when these started, and 1980, this kind of like had its heyday, and then it finally kind of started dropping off, and now it's, it's used some, but not very much. Whereas the equation of state basically was not used at all until about 1980, kind of built up, and then it's still, it's like the prefer preferred model type. So, why do we need a model if we have measured data? Okay, we go to the laboratory, we measure the data. Why can't we just use the, the measured data directly? Okay. So the reason is that lab PVT data directly. So the reason is this. I'm going to plot kind of pressure. This is really composition. That could be composition anywhere in our production system. It could be in the reservoir, in the production tubing, in the surface, even transportation. Reservoir production, um, flow assurance, processing, all sorts of things, until you finally sell the products. So it's got a, it's a, it's, it's, I'm just giving it a direction, it's like, okay. And then we got pressure, so we got our initial reservoir pressure, uh, maybe could even go higher if you're doing gas injection projects, okay. And you got standard conditions down here. And then there's actually another axis here, which is temperature. I'm not going to get fancy. Okay? In reality, a, a production system, a reservoir of the production system, might cover from day one to the end it might cover a, a, a big chunk of this, of this space, pressure, composition, temperature, space. So I'm going to try to sketch a couple of things. Let's say that um, first let's take our PVT data that we measure. Okay? So <clears throat> we probably have the initial fluid out here, and we start, you know, maybe at initial pressure, and we make measurements along here. reservoir temperature, maybe another temperature, we might have uh, lower pressure separator test, we might going in that direction, uh, temperature, uh, lower temperature and different pressures. Um, we might measure some compositions of gases, uh, the, the gases, I don't know, we're going to move them over here, we've got some gas data over here, uh, below the bubble point, maybe some gas data, like that. I should probably color code this. Um, I don't know. This is the kind of data we might measure. Spend thirty thousand dollars measure. Okay. Now I'm going to sketch the the need for 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 data for PVT for engineering. Okay. That includes reservoir, production tubing, where you've got changes in pressures and temperature, process facilities, could go to low temperatures for, you know, gas processing, transportation, bottom of the seabed, and so forth and so on. So what you're going to get is that you're going to get a, 
um, you're going to get a much bigger chunk of this. You might, you know, this might be just for depletion. Um, processing. Uh, and then if you do gas injection, then maybe you have to have this extended out something like this if you if you look at a different so this might be depletion and then you do gas injection okay out here so the point is you're only making a few measurements within this pressure composition temperature space but you need PVT properties everywhere here okay that's the problem so what you'd like to do is you'd like to have this PVT model. Certainly that it covers in this region here, that it can model all of this, what's going on. But it needs to be able to capture. It needs to have a bigger space of accuracy than the actual process. Okay? We want accuracy enveloping everything here okay and the only way you can get that is to use a more rigorous thermodynamic model like an equation of state and even then there's some uncertainty or we really don't know how accurate it is out here because we don't have data okay so what we do is that we we tune the equation of state model to our measured data and hope that the equation of state model does okay outside in, in the region where we need calculations. And if you have the question, is it good enough, what do you do? Any suggestions? Okay. The, the, the flow assurance transport guy comes in and says, well, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I'm looking in this re region here. This is all I care about. You know, flow assurance, transportation. You need to make measurements. Special PVT tests. Okay. You have to, it's the only way you can verify whether the model is doing a good job or not. Okay. When you bring in those measurements, if you do gas injection, you want to do gas injection, then you're going to have to make measurements out here. Okay? So you have to get measurements to get PVT data to tune the equation of state model more accurately, depending on what processes you're looking at. A good model where the key PVT data are within three to five percent at the worst. Okay. Better than three percent in general. Certainly for densities, viscosities you can't get that accurate. Viscosities are hard to get. If you're within ten percent on viscosity, you're probably safe. But on densities, uh, phase volumes, three to five percent, the most. Maybe densities even one to two percent. Um, Phase boundaries, bubble point, dew points, within a few percent at, at the worst. So, generally speaking, except viscosity, you should be within a few percent accuracy for the model. No, there's there's no there's not a, an article written out there or a book written about which types of samples, how many samples for a given field. There, it's it, you don't. I mean, you're you're talking to someone who you know you could ask because I've seen a lot of systems. So what 
the advantage of asking me is that I've looked at a lot of of these purple envelopes, been involved in a lot of different characters. I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of data and see where does the accuracy or inaccuracy occur? Uh, what kind of data should you need? I mean, but it's just, it's like good opinions, but can be wrong. So the only way to find out if you have enough is to start making additional PVT measurements where you are uncertain. Is the only way. So basically you kind of fill in with measured data. So if you say that it's critical that we get this area here right, and the only PVT we, we, data we have is outside that region, you better go get some more measurements. As an example, in Saudi Arabia, every oil sample they've ever measured, they measured at, this is reservoir temperature, if you will, okay? That's the standard. They've measured the same properties at two other temperatures. I think 150 and 100 degrees or something. It's for transportation, pipeline, okay? Somebody came in and said, this is the way you should do it, and they've just done it ever since then. It's not common to do that. So they've got maybe a little, but then they don't measure very much gas composition stuff because they never really cared much about gas <laughs> until lately, okay? And so there was not so much data on gas or not so accurate data on gas. So you, but in any given case, you basically have to go out and if you're stretching outside from where you have measurements, you have to go make new measurements or hope for the best. That's it. So with this in mind, we've got two, two reasons to, to collect samples. The second is to build the PVT model. In that case, we basically need to cover as much of this space as possible with accurate measurements, okay? This red line here that I've drawn, this is for our initial a reservoir composition, or a sample that was in situ representative, okay? That's one line. But within the reservoir, from top to bottom, you may have a huge range of compositions, gas cap, oil with variation with depth, another fault block with a different oil. You may have all sorts of compositions in the reservoir in situ. There's not just one. So, To build the model, you want to use literally all of your samples, okay? Whether they're the wrong GUR, the right GUR, or high GUR, low GUR. So basically for, for this second one, we basically want to use all samples. The more the merrier. But if you've already got five samples with this particular composition where you have PVT data, why measure that a new PVT set? Move over here to a different composition. Spread it out. Okay? So if you're going to do more data for building the PVT data, then you'd like to get the collection of data having a wide range in compositions. Okay? Use all samples with quality PVT data, and we don't want samples that are contaminated with this damn oil-based mud, okay? Because the oil-based mud, it's messing up all the PVT properties, okay? So if you, you prefer samples with no or very little oil-based mud contamination. Okay. We, we just don't want to use those samples unless we have to. If we don't have any other samples that are not contaminated, we just have to use them. For the first reason to collect samples, you basically want to have as many samples spatially as possible, but the thing is that all you need 
his composition. You don't need PVT measurements, okay? Now, if you can get the PVT measurements for in situ samples, that's fine. But you really, to do this spatial distribution, all you need is the composition of samples. Okay? Which means you can use contaminated, oil based mud contaminated samples because we can decontaminate them to come up with the composition. And you basically want to get as many samples in many different places as possible in the reservoir, spatially. Okay? You're trying to map. Okay? And you don't want to map this hill behind us without <laughs> getting some elevations at different points with your GPS, right? You don't want to just like eyeball it. You have to go points on the hill here to get a proper map. Now, since we need compositions here, this um, open hole formation testing type sample, MDT, alias MDT, is really the best source because it is point specific. It's point specific. If you do a separator sample or a cased hole bottom hole sample, you're getting some average over the perforated interval, right? You're not getting a point specific. Over the 20 meters, it's some average composition. Okay? So if you get your first job and they say, oh, we're going to put you on the, you're, you're going to get to do sample, sample collection for this, for this uh, existing field. Okay. My hope is that you come back and you've get, been given this job and what are the questions you're going to ask? When they say, we got a new well, your boss says, you need to collect samples for this new well, it's in the budget, go spend our money. Okay? If you, if you go and ask some questions, you may be able to save some good money. Or you may be able to spend money in a better way. In either case, you've just moved your career up a notch, meaning that your boss should make recognize that and you should not be on the short list for getting fired. Or you should be on the short list for getting promoted. Okay? If you make an intelligent decision on that responsibility. So what is the question you're going to ask? Okay? New samples on a new well. Do we need samples? Okay, we've got a budget. Right? We've got a budget because it's in every well budget probably. But what's the question you're going to ask? Do we need samples? Okay? And the only reason if Curtis is right to collect samples is that well, is it in a new fault block? Okay? Is it the only well in this new fault block? What would the answer be? Do we need, do we need new samples for reason one? Yeah. We don't know what's in that fault block. We have to get samples, right? But let's say there's three other wells in that fault block. And we collected samples on two of them. They had the same composition. Okay. Then you're going to drill right between them. I mean, you don't need the compositions probably for finding out what's there in between these two wells that already exist and they got the same composition. Okay. So we decide we don't need it for the initial for the initial reason one. What about reason two? What are you going to ask your fellow engineers? 
do we have a PVT model for this reservoir? Is it good? Can I check it? In other words, is there a report I can read? Uh, so do you have a model? And if this model is already matching these two neighboring wells very well, okay, your model, I mean, why do you need more PVT data along the same, that same red line? Okay, you're just burning somebody's money. And in today's environment, you burn money, you know, the, the first thing they get rid of is not the samples, they get rid of engineers. It's the easiest. So you go back to the boss and you say, look, you know, we don't need samples. We can save, however, and it's big money offshore. I mean, we can say, we don't need new samples. And the engineer and the boss is going to say, you're a new hire. What the hell do you know? We always do samples. I say, but look, you know, we know what's in the wells around it. It's in a fault block with existing wells. We know the compositions are the same there. We've got a model that's predicting the PVT from those. I mean, the likelihood of something new popping up in the middle, if you want to pay for it and use the money just to be on the safe side, fine, but it doesn't appear that we need to take samples. Okay? Because if you take the samples, you're going you're gonna to have to spend money trying to figure out how to use them, and you don't want to use any money for that. So, so you can come back with an educated, you don't have to understand all the details, but you can ask the two questions. The new well, is it located where we basically know the composition? because we've got a whole bunch of other wells around there. If you don't need a composition to figure out what's there, you can say, well, do I need new PVT data to map out this thing here? Okay. And if you don't need that, then you basically should go back and say, look, you know, let's use this money for something else or just save some money. And then, yeah, then, then that's, all it's, that's all we're talking about. And if the boss says, well, we're going to do it that way because I don't understand why they did the collection last time, but we're going to do it this time just to be on the safe side, then, then that's her decision. Fine. Let her use the money. Let her not take advantage of your recommendation. But eventually, you, may, you keep making the recommendation, and the next well, maybe you need to make a recommendation. Well, this time, you, re you recommend to take samples, and, and the boss says, yeah, but last time we didn't need to. I, I took it off the budget. So says, yeah, but... This is in a new fault block. We don't know what's there. We have to take samples. So you, so you have you have reason for your for your recommendation, and it's no more than what we're talking about here. Okay, that's it.